we're here to talk about stop signs. Um, so let me start by introducing myself. Um, I'm Josh. Uh, I like to call myself a creative technologist. Uh, more and more, I think like what I really mean is dilettante. Um, I work as a qualitative user experience researcher. I've studied interaction design, intellectual property law, anthropology. I've done IT for art galleries. I worked on a Spider-Man movie. Um, those are my credentials. We'll get to that. Um, I like to take things apart and put them back together again. Um, these days, I spend a lot of time on like AI and retro computing projects. Um, sometimes I make dollhouses. That's what I do. That's who I am. Um, like I said, a bit of a dilettante. Mostly, I think it's all fodder for my therapist to you know, tell me about my commitment issues. Um, but all of that is just to say that one of the things that is not on that resume is data scientist. Um, I am very, very far from one. Um, I have never in my life taken a stats class. Uh, I think I failed the one computer science class I took in college. Um, math still gives me cold sweats, even though math people tell me there's no such thing as a math person. It's always math people who say that. Um, anyway, I've always learned exactly enough code to solve whatever problem I am trying to solve at any given moment. Um, so all of that goes to say, you know, if, if I can do anything with data, you know, you all can do it too. Um, and that's relevant because you know, part of what I'm here to talk about is this video of a computer vision program that I built this fall to count cars at my corner in order to prove to the DOT that they should put an all-way stop sign there. Um, yeah, a lot going on there. Um, but uh, it's relevant for a couple of reasons. Obviously, a lot of imposter syndrome coming here and speaking to a program called School of Data. Um, but also relevant because I really hate public speaking, so I'm glad this is a little bit of an intimate room. Um, but it matters, right? Because a lot of what I'm going to talk about and what I've learned from this project is really that like having the data, great start, not enough, right? It's also about learning how to make a little bit of noise. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to walk you through my three simple steps to getting a stop sign at your corner. Um, step one, complain. That's also step two and three, just so you know. <laughs> it's a lot of complaining. Um, so I live in Dimas Park, Brooklyn. Uh, I'm on a wide street with very few traffic controls um, that a lot of drivers use as a quick shortcut from Flatbush Avenue to Ocean Parkway, kind of across the middle of Brooklyn. Um, I grew up not too far from there. I've lived in the neighborhood much of my life. Uh, but we moved into that apartment three years ago, and it immediately became obvious that the status quo was going to get somebody killed. Um, this is a visual of the, the street. This is Dorchester Road. It's, a, it's an odd street, right? It's very wide. Like I said, it's a single lane, one way, east-west street. It's a residential block, um, but completely lacking, uh, mostly completely lacking traffic controls, whereas a lot of the streets north and south have a stoplight on every corner. It's a very attractive shortcut. Um, also, it's not really east and west. It has a, sort of like a northeast, southwest uh, angle to it, which means there are huge visibility problems for drivers. Um, uh, coming up to the intersections and trying to figure out how to cross. Uh, so all of this is a big problem for folks like myself and these two pixelated people from Apple Maps who are trying to cross the street and not get squished. Um, so moved into our apartment three years ago, and one of the first things I did was head to the Department of Transportation site to request my all-way stop sign. Uh, the second thing I did was buy reflective gloves <coughs> to keep my coat pocket. Um, anyone can do this, by the way. This is maybe a very short talk, because anybody can, anybody can go here and do this. Uh, the DOT makes it very easy. Um, you can write to the commissioner. There's a nice little online form. You can select your topic. You can go ahead and do it. Um, and I learned this secret um, that when you write to the DOT and request a stop sign or a traffic control that they have to respond to you and like, actually investigate the problem, I learned this kind of uh, randomly about 20 years ago when I was like, learning to drive around the city for the first time and beginning to realize just how terrifying it is. And uh, I had a friend whose dad worked for the DOT and like, told me this little secret that like, if you write and complain, something might happen. Um, so that is my villain origin story. And I remember the first time I tried it out. It was this intersection near my childhood home. Uh, nothing too special about it, just another one of those like, very poor visibility uh, intersections. Um, Brooklyn's got a lot of them, uh, where you, know, you have to kind of like, as a driver, 
you know, nose your way out into the middle of the, uh, of the street and try to see if there's oncoming traffic and hopefully, you know, not plow over anybody in the process. So I wrote my complaint. Some months later, I got, uh, I got a letter in the mail. They denied my request for an all-way stop, but they daylighted the intersection for me. Um, they removed three parking spots in the process. So though my parents at the time were very proud of me, I didn't want them to tell their friends that I'd taken away their parking. <laughs> um, daylighting, if you're not familiar, that's basically creating visibility at the corner so that, again, drivers have wider field of visibility, um, can, can see oncoming traffic, makes everything safer. It's actually the law in the state of New York, and for reasons that I don't understand, New York City New York City's DOT, I think, exempts itself from this state law. So there's a lot of advocacy around that topic. Um, but anyway, it was a very exciting thing that sort of sent me down this path that I'm now going to send you all down. So anyway, back to present day. Um, if you look up my complaint about uh, Dorchester Road from 2021, you will see what happened. Um, summarily denied. Well, status resolved, actually. Resolution denied. That's you know, an important distinction. Um, the DOT really doesn't explain anything in these cases. It's just uh, kind of a stone wall without any hope of resolution. Um, they said they'd run a study in three years' time. Three years, that would be 2024, which is so far in the future um, that here we still are talking about it. But anyway, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. I'm a nudge. I don't like getting stonewalled, so I kind of thought I would get creative. Um, and I would sit there and kind of like ideate, like lay in bed at night, or I'd dodge cars during the day and ideate ways like that I might be able to change some of the phrasing of my letter or request something a little bit different to get some help. Um, which brings us to step two of my three-step plan, which is show bureaucracy who's boss. Again, it's complaint. It's always going to be complaint. Um, if you have to live within the grinding wheels of bureaucracy, you might as well make it work for you. That's how I feel. And since you all came out here, it's raining. I'm so we're here talking about stop signs. Maybe you all kind of know this. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a powerful trick. And I kind of like rules and structure, you know? I kind of like bureaucracy a little bit because it's a burden, but it's a system. And once you figure it out, you can start to make it work for you and you can begin to affect rules or you can begin to, once you learn the rules, you can begin to affect change. Um, for instance, it may not surprise you to learn, I really love reporting potholes. Um, I tried it out once. Within just a few days, there's fresh asphalt on the street by my, my little pothole. Um, I'm sure the city would Preferred if I did not report so many potholes. I'm kind of embarrassed about this very real screenshot showing the number of potholes I've reported, although I, the time horizon is several years. But it's not my system, right? It's, it's theirs. They want to swiftly repair any damage because it's potential documented evidence for, of you know, potential liability. I just want my pothole fixed. Uh, but if it works for them, it works for me. Stop signs are interesting because it turns out, I've learned, it's, it's about changing a thing rather than fixing a broken thing. So the city, the city uh, doesn't care quite as much about that. Um, so we have to get a little bit more creative. Because uh, you know, I kind of feel like if the bureaucracy says no and you accept that, then you, know, you might as well not have shown up in the, in the first place. Um, and I started thinking about this as like active patience. It's the term that I came up with when I was furiously writing out these notes at 10 o'clock this morning. Active patience. Um, patience is a virtue, right? But it can sort of like slide into defeatism sometimes uh, if you're not careful. But active patience is about like keeping the flame burning, staying gently, respectfully annoying, um, showing up and making sure the bureaucracy has to deal with you. So I wrote a few more letters to the DOT. That's where this is all going. Um, I requested a neck down, uh, which is also known as a curb extension. So you may have seen these more and more around the city, these sort of bulbs around the, the curb, which uh, make the streets narrower, it slows down traffic, gives pedestrians a little bit more room to cross the street. Um, so status resolved, resolution denied. Um, I thought, oh, bioswales. You might have seen these rain gardens around the city, right, which also have this kind of secondary benefit of slowing down traffic as they, um, they do narrow streets. Uh, also, separate major flooding issue on my, on my corner um, that is also unresolved. Anyway, denied. Um, I asked for speed bumps. Even one of these like little, what they call speed cushions that are kind of popping up some places around the city where you don't really have to slow down. Um, resolution denied. I asked for a, a marked pedestrian crosswalk without any traffic control. Just, you know, put a crosswalk in. Um, I actually think that's a terrible solution, right? Because it confuses everybody. But I thought like, okay, well, you know, Maybe if you just do like a little something, then I can ask for the next thing. Um, resolution denied. Asked for a bike lane, because that also uh, 
you know, provides a lot of important traffic calming um, function. This one actually wasn't denied. Apparently, it is actually part of some longer-term plan that the DOT has for the uh, for the um, for the community. It's just been years now, and nothing has come of it. Um, so I'm not really holding my breath. This one I was very very proud of. I thought it was very clever. I went back to archival street view imagery and found this. Uh, for 1.10 years ago, there were street narrowing markings on the street. I guess they'd repaved it and not put those back in. And I thought, okay, well, there's precedent. Surely, you know, surely they'll put these back. And they did actually approve this, but again, it's been two years, nothing has happened. No new paint, no stop sign, not great. Um, by the way, if you're wondering where all these ideas came from, uh, there are a lot of resources for this stuff. Uh, my favorite one is the DOT's own street design manual, which you can access for free online, or you can get a copy of the, of the book, which I meant to bring with me today but didn't. Um, but it outlines kind of all of the city's favorite and approved traffic calming measures. So I feel like there's nothing more uh, effective than pulling pages from their book, and that's worked for me in other cases, if not for this one intersection. Um, so when all of this fails, um, as it did for me, and then you get to step three. Complain. Uh, step three, prior, perhaps the step that is most relevant for School of Data, um, collect data. Um, so in my case, I, I really I couldn't understand why the DOT had denied all of my requests, um, what their justification was. Uh, you know, I wanted details. But the process is a black box. So uh, I pulled out a law school trick that feels very appropriate for us being at the CUNY School of Law, and I filed a FOIL request. Um, and so FOIL, if you're not familiar with it, FOIL is the New York State version of the Federal Freedom of Information Act. So any citizen can request public records from any agency within state uh, or city government, I think, um, as a matter of public policy, right? Subject to certain exemptions like um, records that you know, might uh, uh, interfere with somebody's personal privacy or interfere with law enforcement or judicial proceedings. Uh, but it too is as simple as finding a form and submitting it online. And I'll have some links at the, at the back end of this presentation. Um, so I went on and I submitted my FOIL request. I asked for all of the records uh, pertaining to the traffic study that had been done in July of 2021 at the corner of Dorchester Road and Westminster Road in Brooklyn. Um, and a few months after I submitted my FOIL request, something arrived in my inbox. Um, actually, so it's not true. Uh, I had to, I think I had to send, I think I had to send, I got another email that said like, do you still want this? It was like months later when they'd gotten around to it and they wanted to like check in to see if it was worth their time. I was like, yes, I want this. Um, anyway, eventually this came, a 34 page PDF of my 2021 traffic study, my glorious study. Uh, so I was very excited, cleared my calendar, cracked it open. And um, gosh, it's an inscrutable document, my God. Um, yeah, it's filled with pages and diagrams like this, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of scanned, you know, scanned, uh, hand annotated documents um, that I have had to reverse engineer that I will now share my layperson's understanding with you. Um, so things like this, so on the left, this is the, this measures the distance between traffic controls. So I think if it's less than 500 feet, the city doesn't like to put another stop sign in. There are some, you know, some thoughts that uh, too many stop signs can be, uh, uh, can be more dangerous because they can encourage drivers to speed up to make up the lost time. So there's a lot of you know, thoughts there. So um, yeah, I think, all the, I think all the reds here are stop signs, all the greens are traffic signals here on the left. So you can see the east-west street just north of mine and just south of mine have a lot of, uh, lot of signals in my street, not so much. Uh, on the right, a diagram, very important for what's gonna come next, where somebody had gone out and like measured uh, a lot of stuff. You know, the city did this. They have to do all of this, which is cool. Uh, they measured the, the width of the street itself, um, you know, what are the, uh, uh, the buildings, where are their hedges, what are the visibility issues, signposts, all of this stuff that, you know, that some surveyor came out and looked at uh, before denying all of my requests. And uh, yeah, and a lot of other stuff like this, a lot of data with zero context. Uh, this one is probably the one I spent the most time with. Um, this is actually, this volume classification and turning counts page uh, from this traffic study is where the actual uh, measurement of the volume of traffic at this intersection uh, is captured. So this sort of cross in the middle represents this like primary street, which is where I want my stop sign, and the secondary um, street that, uh, that is perpendicular to it, where there is a stop sign. Um, 
the numbers represent the number of cars in a one hour period. Their surveyors come and uh, they come during rush hour one morning and they come back during rush hour one evening. And for a 60 minute period, they measure the number of cars, bikes and pedestrians, adults, children, uh, senior citizens who cross at each of the four crossings of the intersection, the ones who go straight, the ones who turn, it is very thorough. Um, but I had to make sense of all of this. At the bottom left where it says gaps in, 30 uh, gaps in 60 minutes, 131, that wound up, uh, wound up being very important. Um, what is a gap? What is a gap in 60 minutes? How is that calculated? How is that decided? 131. Um, again, no context here in this, in this study about that. Um, so I had to figure it out. With the help of things like this sheet, uh, which again, printed out Excel sheet, no access to the formula or the, you know, the rationale that inform any of this. This is the all important gap analysis. Um, I'll fast forward to what I've learned, which is that the, um, uh, what is it, the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices or something, the MUTCD is sort of like the, the big sort of like federal Bible of this stuff that, um, that basically outlines things like, hey, for any crossing, you know, you need to have a certain number of gaps for pedestrians to cross. Uh, if you don't have that number of gaps, that's a good argument that you may need something like a stop sign. Um, there's a complicated formula. Um, it turns out that at my intersection, based on the width of the intersection, the sort of like speed of an average human, um, the gap for safe crossing is considered to be 14 seconds. So basically this document, it turns out, uh, captures over that 60 minute period in 15 minute intervals, how many of those gaps that were 14 seconds or longer um, this surveyor found uh, for, for the, in this case, the PM rush. Um, so all of this was sort of this kind of reverse engineering process um, that, I, uh, that I went through. And I mentioned the MUTCD. There were other resources like New York State's uh, um, paperwork that um, uh, the traffic engineers used to kind of complete their studies that I Googled and found. Um, in some cases, I was piping screenshots and text into ChatGPT to just be like, what am I looking at? What is this? Um, none of it really designed for civilian use. And one of the other things, I have never been as a traffic engineer. So anyway, all of this at least provided the template and the common language to be able to help me convince the city that their data is flawed and that my street needs fixing. Um, which brings us to step 3B, um, the all important step 3B, uh, which is pretend that I have standing to you know, be here and talk about data science-y things. Um, so I spent a few days trying to parse you know, the traffic study. This is another sheet from it. This may actually be my favorite one, the warrant criteria. Yeah, there's red. That seems bad. Orange, maybe less bad. Yeah, that's about as much as I started with. Um, but the bit about crashes at the bottom caught my eye. Uh, maybe a little hard to see, but part of this um, is, you know, part of this requires the, uh, the, the person measuring to just look up in the data how many uh, crashes there have been at this intersection over a three year period. Um, this says one, but I've lived there now for three years. I've seen many, many accidents there. Um, I was pretty confident that even though not all accidents are going to get reported, there's probably more than one. Um, so, you know, so demystifying this and trying to kind of double check the data and seeing that there were some obvious places where the data um, had gaps or inaccuracies uh, really kind of lit a fire for me. Um, and so I went looking for crash reports and I went to our favorite NYC open data dashboard that is you know, largely why we're here talking about this. Um, I've used this before for a lot of like creative coding projects that I've worked on. Uh, since you've asked as an aside, my favorite data set I think is the, uh, the list of every street tree in the city that includes GPS coordinates and the species of the tree and its condition. Um, and many years ago I did a project like a physical computing project where like it's a little wristband that sort of pinged every time you came too close to a ginkgo tree. Like there's fun stuff you can do. Um, but, you know, but that was sort of my gateway into, into open data. Uh, but I went here to, to take a look at what collision data I could find. Um, and as you can see here, there are a lot of accidents. There's not one, there's a pretty big list here. Uh, it turns out in a 36 month period, there were at least seven accidents at this corner, well over the I think five is the, the floor that would you know, qualify to like, make a case for getting a stop sign at an intersection. Um, and it turns out that the metadata is a little bit lacking. So I live the corner of Westminster Road. Um, in many cases, it's spelled Westminster. 
So that's something that isn't going to show up in the data without a little bit of massaging. Um, the police who are you know, filling out these reports that are getting translated in here, right? they may, in many cases, use different columns. There's a column here that says on street and cross street. But if those get switched, you know, do, those, you know, do those factor into whatever, um, you know, whatever filter or formula is being used here? In many cases, no. There are cases when folks use GPS coordinates or, um, or specific addresses rather than intersections. So there's a lot of you know, issues with the data hygiene that, again, inspired me to kind of push further. Um, and so I continued with open data. I won't get into all of the screenshots here. Um, basically, as you're kind of building the case, and I'll, maybe I'll go back for a second to this screenshot. So what this, uh, what this page does, right, is it, it is sort of like building the case for a traffic control. So um, they're called warrant criteria. So there's, in this case, I think there's seven, um, seven possible like, arguments you might make for why you would get a stop sign. So the crashes, that's one of them, right? The distance between traffic controls, that's another one. How close are you to a school? Do you not have enough gaps in a 60-minute period for people to cross? All of these are different reasons that kind of add together uh, to this subjective but data-backed kind of argument that you could make that it might be worth putting a stop sign in at a corner. So open data was a huge resource for that. Um, you know, data sets for, again, like street telemetry and details and sort of mapping against like what was shown uh, when it came to distance between, uh, between traffic controls, uh, list of community boards, 311 complaints that are mostly mine. Um, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, list of schools. So we can figure out like pro how many schools am I in proximity of that kind of change the calculus uh, for, you know, even things like how many seconds constitutes a reasonable gap, right? That's, that's calculated differently if you were near a school with the assumption that children walk slower. If there are more of them crossing the street, it would take them longer. So all of this is very important data to kind of like build the case. Um, and so I just kept going. I went on Amazon and I bought a radar gun. Um, I you know, hung out on the street and just measured, you know, measured stuff. Um, I also learned that my cat goes down, runs down my hallway at 14 miles an hour. <laughs> so just so you know. Um, uh, yeah. And, you know, and then I had to kind of figure out like how, as I'm collecting data, how do I kind of replicate the rest of the original traffic studies findings? Um, and you know, as I said, a big part of this is counting cars. I figured there must be some way to automate the process. Uh, rather than spending an hour staring out of my bedroom window with a pen and a clipboard. Um, and that brings me to the video that I queued up earlier. So this is basically where I, where I netted out. Uh, so this is the output of a custom script that detects and tracks moving objects uh, within a pre-recorded video. So that I took a video in the same kind of, I think it was like a Monday from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning and 4.30 to 5.30 at night, something like that. Um, and then I processed it, and this is the kind of results of that, that, uh, that process. So this counts every car heading eastbound and southbound, straight and turning, uh, measures the gaps between them, uh, basically reproduces that document that we saw before that is measuring, you know, measuring kind of all of that within that one hour period. Um, so I'm just going to voice over briefly uh, the tools that, you know, that led to uh, this or made this possible. Um, so the first and primary tool uh, is an object detection tool that is known as YOLO, or you only look once. Uh, so YOLO is a computer vision model that can take in an image uh, or frame of a video and classify all the objects in it. And it does it quite well and quite, um, quite fast. Um, so you can have it churn through a video and, you know, and identify objects within it pretty effectively. It has a library of classes for, uh, for common use cases. So in my case, um, I was looking for you know, pedestrians, cars, trucks, bikes. right? Um, and it was easy to you know, say, like, hey, I want you to kind of ignore flowers, dogs, trees, you know, all the kind of other random stuff. I just need to count what I need to count. Um, so this was kind of one, one piece of this, of this puzzle. The second uh, open source library that fed into this is called ByteTrack. So ByteTrack takes an object detected via YOLO and tracks it. Uh, for any given object, it does its best to kind of track it over the frames of a video. It gives it a little identifier and it, you know, and it measures it, um, which of course is important since part of what we're doing here is measuring you know, a vehicle passing through space. And this is all tied together uh, with a tool called Supervision. So Supervision is a, um, a third library that is the sort of like um, maybe best understood as an easy to use wrapper around these two other tools, YOLO and ByteTrack. Uh, 
um, that also has some of its own functionality that allows you to, um, or allows it to count each of these objects. So with these three free open source libraries, I was able to build this you know, fairly messy rudimentary script right, to count cars on my street and append to the study. And I'll just go over like very, you know, I'm not going to, I don't know, go into line by line code, um, but I'll just kind of briefly talk about what it does. So it basically does these four things, right? So first, um, I'm setting up an area of the video that I want to track, right? So in my case, there wind up being four of them. I think there's two here, but there's four. Basically, I'm putting in the coordinates of a polygon in the video, right? Like in this kind of upper left-hand quadrant, that's kind of where my southbound lane is that I need to track anything that kind of passes through that. So that's what's happening there at the top. Um, second, the script is counting the objects that it thinks are vehicles as they pass through each of those polygons. Third, each car you know, gets a unique identifier, so that gets added to a list, um, making sure it doesn't get counted twice, um, and setting up the data so that we can measure the gap between them. And finally, um, we set a timestamp and basically calculate the gap in seconds in which a pedestrian might be able to safely cross uh, using that same calculation that New York State's data you know, demands. So that's kind of what's happening here, basically. I'm reproducing that process of like, you know, a surveyor sitting in their car, you know, counting, counting uh, cars and pedestrians passing by with this uh, computer vision uh, algorithm. Obviously a lot more to unpack and say about that, uh, but I think it might be more useful to kind of talk a little bit about the process here. Because um, I think like, I don't know, I started this by saying like, hey, I'm not a data scientist, anybody can do this, and I've gone through like a fairly technical explanation. Um, but uh, I think it's probably worth talking about the way that generative AI has played a role in different parts of this journey. So all of the kind of creative coding projects that I have undertaken in the past year have really been like pair programming projects with, uh, you know, with ChatGPT in many cases. Um, it's been a fascinating learning journey, especially if you were like a qualitative based person, you know, like I am. Um, it's really interesting to kind of go through that process of like using generative AI as a learning tool. Um, and it is like a miracle and it's frustrating. It is, it is a very unique type of frustrating miracle to kind of try to build something like this with ChatGPT. Um, but I found it really effective in this case to kind of start with large goals, give ChatGPT a sense of what I'm trying to do, and, you know, and have it break down into kind of more testable incremental steps. This is a very early screenshot in which I'm just like, hey, I just, this is kind of what I'm trying to do. Like, where do I even start? In which ChatGPT is like, hey, YOLO, that's the thing. You know, look here. Um, and then gave me a script, which certainly didn't work, but it was, you know, but an important starting point to iterate off of. Um, so all of which is to say, it, you know, it allowed me to build this functional proof of, uh, proof of concept, deploy it, iterate it on it, and then come back to ChatGPT, right, and have it like hang on new functionality as I was going, uh, slowly one step at a time. So really powerful, uh, you know, really powerful kind of addition to, to the toolkit. Um, and of course, you know, ChatGPT helped when it was time for me to compile my findings into a dossier to send over to the DOT. Uh, I'm a great writer, but I am conflict diverse. So I asked ChatGPT to vehemently insist on my stop sign. And it more than followed through. Um, and I gave it, so I gave it all of my data. I gave it all of the proof points that, you know, from my data collection. I'd uploaded the videos to YouTube, put everything in it. Um, and off my study went. With, uh, with a clear data-backed argument containing you know, all of those proof points and all of those things that did not match the data from the 2021 study. So I sent it off to the DOT. I sent a CC to the Transportation Committee of my local community board. And you know, what's really interesting is it took five days to get a call from the DOT. So five days I had a voicemail waiting from Diana, Diana with the DOT, um, after this, you know, this journey that is really like now been a three-year journey. Um, so just pause there because I think that's like, uh, you know, it's a powerful uh, indicator of the impact of, you know, of using data to help kind of make your case and, and make your argument. Um, but now with that victory lap underway, I should probably break the news. I should have told you when you walked in the door here, which is that I do not have my stop sign yet. Um, I know, I know. It's like a really, you know, crescendo, the, the climax of this conversation. Um, the DOT was calling to say they have agreed to run, this was 
last fall, they agreed to run another study of their own. But, you know, but earlier, right? I had to wait at that point another six, eight months or something. So, you know, I got my six to eight months. Uh, they asked me to personally recommend a time for them to come by and do that, you know, any other like data that I might be able to offer. So, you know, the point is it got attention, it got eyes. The process and the, you know, and the act of patience, you know, kind of grinds on. Um, but uh, what I think is really maybe like the, I'm going to scrap this entire talk this morning to you to like make this the, you know, the thing that I actually wanted to say. Because um, Diana from the DOT is like one person in this process. Um, I'm one person in this process. But ultimately, like the data is nice. It's a tool. It is important. Um, but it is the people, right? The people that matter. Um, and it's easy. I often forget about this, right? I'm, you know, I'm sending my little letters and I'm complaining on 311. You know, the grinding wheels of bureaucracy feel very anonymous. Um, but there is always a, a person on the other end of the line. And I will say, while I don't have a stop sign, I do have a walkabout with the Brooklyn DOT commissioner on Wednesday um, and, and our local council person. Um, and I'm really wondering whether our commissioner will recognize my name since I've written many letters complaining to him. Um, but we'll find out. But I, I really, like, I can't, I can't take credit for that, at least not full credit, because as you can see, like, you know, they're not coming to the block because of, like, my perfectly crafted, you know, AI-generated arguments. Right, they're coming because, you know, it turns out, right, like, I'm not the only one complaining. There's, you know, I have neighbors who I don't even know about who have been part of this process or gone on their own journeys um, who, you know, have been agitating. Folks, like, doing it on their own, folks who have shown up at some of the neighborhood association and community board meetings that, like, I've been pretty quiet about in this talk. Um, and, uh, and I think, like, turns out that's what really matters. Um, when I meet with the commissioner, you know, I get to put like a dossier of data in his hand. I get to like give him facts. And facts are really great. That's important. That gives him like, you know, that makes my case for me. I'd like to think he's, you know, will be armed with reasons to support what I'm trying to accomplish. But it's no substitute for community. Um, even blogging about this post and like the amount of work that I put in and the sort of effort that I, you know, or the, the, the steps that I've taken to get to, you know, the point where I'm at today, uh, that's, that has led to things like this speaking engagement. Um, that's gotten me to meet uh, passionate advocates who have been like doing this work and fighting for a long time, folks from Beta NYC or Open Plans or other organizations, a lot of folks in the community. Um, I have, you know, gave another talk about this a couple months ago where somebody from the DOT was in the, uh, in the audience and came up and we had a long conversation afterwards. And he was from a part of the DOT that was a different part of the DOT where he could not help me. But, but he was there, and we were, and he was able to shed light, you know, again on my layperson's understanding, um, and give me some clues about how the system actually works. And if there is anybody from the DOT in the audience today who's going to tell me all the things that I'm wrong about, I'm very eager to talk to you <laughs> at length. Um, but coming back to the people, so like, like I mentioned about the block associations and the neighborhood associations filled with people who know people, like that is the thing that matters, and I hope that is, you know. You've kind of been going around today and going to talks and meeting people and learning about things like the making the connections. Turns out it's the thing that matters. Um, and I know there have been some projects that some folks have uh, talked about today, doing things like increasing visibility and transparency into community board meetings. So there's a lot of like great work happening kind of around this stuff. Um, but anyway, whenever I talk about this stuff, I always like to throw up a photo of my friend Paul. Um, who for many years owned All Mac Hardware, uh, which is above the Newkirk Plaza B&Q station. Um, uh, and the plaza is really interesting. It's this like strange no man's land that has this like vacuum of responsibility. Um, so he owned this hardware store above this plaza where like the MTA sort of owns the plaza and the DOT sort of owns it, but none of them know, you know, like want to admit that they own it. So I will show you like none of my pothole filling requests have ever been, you know, Nothing has ever happened in that, in that plaza. But Paul, um, who passed away about 10 years ago, um, you know, he was the guy who did like, all of the, the like, little work that nobody else did and nobody else saw, because um, he owned the hardware store in the plaza. He was the one who would donate the planters and the cans of paint and would like, spend that time go replacing light bulbs and sort of making up for the gap. So you know, I try to, I don't know, try to like, channel that and be the little Paul Goldman that I want to see in the world, and I, I recommend that to you. All of you, um, you know, can, a paint, can make a, a big 
bit of difference here. Um, and this is like such an aside, I threw this in five minutes before I came in here. But um, I'll mention it anyway that like lately I've been working on a lot of projects where I'm trying to find ways to like scale and automate all the little Paul Goldman moments that are all around us. So like all of these like little, you know, all these little bits of advocacy that don't always um, uh, don't always connect, right? So this is something I put together in the in the winter. This is called Save Midwood Station. It's a pretty simple site uh, that is basically designed to solve one problem, which is that the USPS lost their lease on a post office around where I live in Dimas Park. Um, they will. I guess they're trying to move to some new facility that is well outside the zip code, far, far away from the community. Um, and they're only accepting feedback by physical mail sent to their like East Coast leasing department in North Carolina. So if you want to complain, you know, they don't make it as easy as the DOT. So I built this uh, tool which scales one-to-one -one feedback. Basically, you fill in some details, things that you might want to um, put in your letter. Uh, it will use generative AI to write a letter. Um, and uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it'll uh, use generative AI to write a letter uh, uh, for you, kind of a, you know, personalized. And then maybe most importantly, you can pay a buck fifty, which is what I pay for the API, and your letter gets automatically printed and mailed off to North Carolina, you know, via snail mail, um, using the API of a service called Lob.com. So no more walking to the blue mailbox, which is great because the blue mailbox, in my case, is across the street that doesn't have a stop sign. Um, <laughs> Anyway, things like this that I think are really, you know, just kind of also speak to some of the power um, of like finding those like little moments and trying to, you know, trying to kind of like weasel your way in there a bit. Um, and I also want to just point out that though I spent some time talking about AI and talking about computer vision, um, none of those, like I said in the beginning, those skills are very optional. Um, and to whatever degree I have them, like they are, they are not necessary to, to be <laughs> respectfully annoying. Um, I, so I mentioned I stood on the corner with a, the speed gun I bought on Amazon. Um, I wound up sitting at my desk with the scorekeeper app, uh, running through like my video at 2x speed, just like feverishly tapping every time a car passed the screen. Did it like six times just to kind of double check my numbers and make sure you know, that the data was good. So there are a lot of problems, some high tech, some very much not high tech, uh, you know, to kind of approaching some of this stuff. Um, and so very lastly, really just want to remind folks here like about patience and you know, how it pays off. So, um, so this past summer, the city installed a traffic light elsewhere in my neighborhood at a different intersection that I and others have been complaining about for over a decade. I found a photo of the first time that they rejected my <laughs> request in 2011. And uh, they're mentioning in 2023 that it was going to be installed. Um, so I consider that a pretty big win. Uh, I'd written in a few times, other folks had as well, like just, you know, you know, when you're working with bureaucracy, there are a few different ways to speed it up, but sometimes you just have to like stick around. Um, so I'm off to fight my next battle. Um, I want the city to replace a goddamn light bulb uh, in a street light. Uh, this is required so far, a year of back and forth with Con Ed via Twitter DMs, many 301 requests, learning what a stop tag is from the DOT, um, all of these things. These, anyway, I, that's a whole different talk. But uh, while I'm doing that, um, I just wanted to give you some resources uh, that can help you start on your journey of being gently and respectfully annoying to um, your elected officials and their appointees and the underpaid folks who work for them getting paper cuts on all the envelopes that you or I am sending them. And if any of you again in the room are those people, I'm so sorry and thank you. Um, yeah, just some links to some resources that'll get you started along your journey. So, give folks a chance to take a photo of that. And uh, that is mostly what I got for you all. So, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, any, any questions, uh, any, any thoughts, yeah. Um, this was really enjoyable, wonderful, thank you. Love the call to be respectfully annoying. You ever think about making a stop sign? You know, I'm so glad that you asked that. I've, I've seen like, because I've seen the people who like come and, uh, and you know, with their very cool machines to install the like, to do the crosswalk paint. And I've just thought like, if I just give the guy 20 bucks, will he just go around the corner? You know, I wanted to do it. Um, and 
the other thing I was going to put to answer this, the other thing I was going to put in this presentation, I didn't quite get around to, was there was an artist um, in I think I'm going to say L.A. about 10, 15 years ago, who folks have heard of this story, who um, did some did this gorilla piece where he put up, uh, uh, went up on the 405 and put, um, I think it was the 405, and put this like. Uh, you know, this sort of interstate badge with an arrow on an existing sign over the interstate to compensate for this problem that had bugged him for many years where the official sign on the interstate was, I don't know, I think, I think the, the arrow was pointing the wrong way or there wasn't an arrow and it was like on the wrong lane of the highway so folks were getting into accidents and it was confusing everybody. And so he did this gorilla piece and he fabricated this perfect sign and went up in the dead of night and like installed it and it took a very long time for anyone official to notice and eventually the city of Los Angeles or Caltrans or whoever, you know, officially implemented, like they replaced his sign with an official implementation that matched that, uh, um, you know, matched his kind of layout. So that's sort of like, it's always been an inspiration <laughs> to me. Um, I have not, you know, I've not yet put my own, my own stop sign on the corner, but uh, if this weren't being recorded, maybe I, I'd admit to it. I don't know. I wouldn't put it past me. I'll just say that. Is it on your property? Oh, yeah. That could be something. Yeah. Yeah. Again, see, it's about being creative. Just have to get clever with it all. Or I thought, you know, maybe we could get together and like hire somebody, you know, hire a crossing guard. There are plenty of places where like, you know, like Barclays Center, right? They have private security that comes and deals with their intersection. I'm sure my neighbors and I would be willing to do something like that. So I don't know, a lot of ideating yet to come. Yeah. Hi, thanks so much. That was really great. You know, you've done so many things I've always wanted to do. Oh. Oh. Hi, thanks. You've done so many things that I've always wanted to do, so it's just great. Thank you for going there uh, on my behalf, I guess. Um, uh, to what extent, then, does quantity of responses make a difference? You know, if, if 10,000 people in the neighborhood went out and said, we need this stop sign or else, I mean, it, it, does it make any difference at all? It seems the DOT are running on their own metrics the other day, and they can't be moved um, unless told by somebody above them. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I. You know, I, I again, as a layperson, I don't know. I don't know what makes the difference. What I do know, right, is that there are a lot of there are a lot of things that matter as much or more, you know, than the numbers, right? So, um, one example that always comes to my mind this is morbid, right? But like it, the the DOT is always very there. It's always very easy for them to act right after somebody dies. You know, folks are, like familiar with the um, bike lane in Gowanus on 9th Street and 2nd Avenue that uh, was, you know, I think anybody who's ever biked there for many years knew that it was a very, very rough situation and was not, you know, converted into a protected bike lane until maybe 24 hours after somebody died there last year. Um, so there are like, you know, there, there are cases in which, you know, in which the city acts. And I think there are a variety of things that are in the toolkit that have more to do with like, finding a way to make noise and like be, you know, be loud or like figure out how to, you know, get the, I don't know, get something like this put onto Gothamist, right? That would, you know, get the attention of somebody who can make the call um, that maybe 10,000 letters wouldn't necessarily, you know, wouldn't necessarily do. And I think it's more about kind of taking like that kind of portfolio approach and um, when it comes to your advocacy, but uh, I'm, you know, always open to suggestions. Hi, Jess. Yeah. Great talk. Yeah. In fact, I actually came to this because of you for your talk. So, Thank uh, you. the thing is, I actually live in Ocean Ave, mm. so very close to you. So, I, I guess one thing that I wanted to ask about, like with the video camera, what about the legality of that pointing at the intersection from your house? Is it totally okay? Or? Well, I, I can't. I wouldn't consider myself qualified to give legal advice and can't give legal advice. Um, I can tell you, it is public space. You know there's a limit to what right of privacy or expectations of privacy that individuals can have in a public place. So I think there's a lot there to explore and, you know, and, and learn about. Um, I also think there's, you know, that's a very, like, very legitimate question and there's a lot of different approaches and I wish I had remembered to include the name of some other projects that, uh, that other folks are working on that I've come across. Um, uh, uh, folks who found, you know, found other ways to, to like build, uh, uh, use different types of sensors and like mount them on lampposts uh, in a very like privacy forward way to, you know, to track data like this without, you know, capturing, you know, videos of people on the, on the street. So there's a lot of good work happening there. Um, as for any of the legal implications, I would be so interested to hear from an expert, but yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, cool, yeah. This is super fascinating. Um, I'm curious, uh, I was actually surprised uh, when you filed the FOIL request, like how, I guess, thorough the original uh, traffic study was, but obviously, like, you uncovered a lot of like, gaps in the data and just kind of flaws in the methodology. So I'm curious, like, um, uh, like, do you see any opportunities to, like, um, I guess, improve, like, the, the, the government's, uh, when they do conduct studies and analysis, like, any way to kind of scale up your, um, you know, your, your kind of methodology to make them more efficient and more accurate? Um, do you see Oh, absolutely, yeah. I think like what they what they do as far as it appears to me, again, not a traffic engineer, seems to be like a very low tech approach and way to way to solve the, the problem. And I think that has its merits, um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and yeah, and I think it comes down to, you know, well, for one thing, creating a proof of concept like this and figuring out how to scale it even on a smaller scale level. So if you know, had conversations with other folks who are, you know, this is one intersection in one neighborhood. I've spoken to a lot of folks who are very interested in figuring out ways to fix their intersections. And um, and something that I'm personally trying to do is build out a version of this. It's a little more robust and plug and play so that folks can, you know, point a camera outside their own windows and, uh, and get some of this data for themselves. Um, so I'm hoping that that kind of work and that kind of advocacy might, you know, encourage the DOT. Um, but I think, you know, the problem is right there not, I wouldn't necessarily expect the, that agency to be incentivized by, um, you know, by increased transparency in some cases. Um, like I said, they're, they, have to, they have to respond. They, they have a mandate to do a traffic study like this. I'm sure the mandate includes collecting the data that they collect, which is thorough, wonderfully. Um, but I don't think that extends to, uh, to making that, you know, that process transparent to civilians. So I would love to see that. Um, I think for now, it's kind of up to us uh, to try to share some of our learnings and share learnings about what's worked and what hasn't. Um, and, uh, you know, when we kind of do stuff like this or, re, you know, reverse engineer some of these kind of black box processes to, to make that as transparent and public as possible so that uh, folks who are interested in this kind of advocacy have the tools they need to do it. But I would love to see the DOT take a lead on some of that. Uh, I'm a member of the South Midwood Residents Association. Excellent. Tell a neighbor. And uh, there was uh, someone called for a traffic light to be installed on Farragut. Hmm. And, uh, and then there was a uh, involved debate about the value of a traffic light versus a stop sign. And the theory was that if traffic lights, people accelerate to get through the lights, and thus it's less safe than a stop sign. Do you have thoughts on that? Okay. Yeah, I don't know the data on that. Um, you know, when I've spoken to other fo folks from the DOT, one thing they've told me, which is almost infuriating, is that like a stop sign is very cheap to install. You know, a traffic signal might cost, I don't know, $250,000. I'm making that number up, but I believe it was close to what I was told to install, like one, one light plus annual maintenance. Whereas, um, you know, a stop sign is more or less like a piece of metal that you, sheet metal that you set up and, and mostly can forget. Except in your case where you mentioned that there were four of them that had, had to get replaced. So if it's a particularly dangerous intersection, might need some bollards. Um, but uh, as for, yeah, as for the safety implications, I really, you know, I don't personally know the answer. Um, I do think it's really interesting to kind of fact, think about all the different factors that like go into like how something like that gets installed. Um, like in, I live in Dimmis Park West. Uh, there is, you know, our sister neighborhood association that is the Dimmis Park Neighborhood Association. If you go to that side of Dorchester Road, they have two traffic signals and a speed uh, camera. And, you know, I think like that speaks in some cases to like, who do you know? And, you know, and what kind of, you know, and how connected are your neighbors? And how rich are your neighbors? And like how, you know, it's really interesting how, you know, how some of these decisions are made in ways that go beyond some of the like warrant criteria that we went through. Um, but I'd be very interested in seeing the data. Um, at this point, New York feels almost lawless enough that it doesn't matter. I'd be very curious to find out. Please. There's also a lot of interest in installing noise cameras. Yeah, we, I feel like uh, right. I feel like the city used to. I feel like the city used to do some of that. What I'm remembering is that a few years ago, the city removed all of the signs uh, asking you know drivers to stop honking or warning them about you know fines because nobody listened and it was you know it was just like too much kind of noise. Uh, you know, I mean, not, I shouldn't use the word noise. What's that? Oh, do they work there? Oh, really? Well, I'd be very eager to learn more. Yeah, that'd be awesome. 
thank you so much for the presentation. It's really inspiring and interesting um, to see your process. And I was wondering if you could talk about um, like what inspired you to start documenting your process and like telling a story about it. It seems like you have a practice of like not just having like doing these um, outreach efforts and uh, data collection, but actually you know like uh, presenting it to the community. So I'm just curious where that motivation came from and um, what, what Yeah, it really does not come naturally to me at all. Um, I, you know, I think it's something where through little, like, like little kind of drips and drops, it sort of, uh, it sort of progressed. Um, I, you know, I found that by sharing some of my work in public or sharing some of these works in progress, that would always seem to spin up some interesting conversation or lead to a connection with another neighbor or somebody else who is working on a startup doing something adjacent to something I'm interested in. So it's just been like a very, um, you know, very like virtuous cycle that I've, I've found. Um, but like I, again, I, this is, that as a process for me is something that I think I've picked up really in the past year. Um, and yeah, and it's just, you know, it's just kind of progressed since, since then. Also, I got laid off and I had a little bit more time on my hands. So, you know, it was very helpful to, uh, you know, as part of, uh, as part of the process to, to like be able to lean into some of this a bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, but it's been, it's been so gratifying to get to, get to speak to folks and meet other folks um, and get to push some of these projects forward. Um, hi, uh, I was very interested that many of the groups that you contacted have some kind of official feedback form to be contacted by the public. I'm curious if there were any situations where that didn't exist and you had to, uh, I don't know, find someone's name and then find their email address or find some unofficial way of contacting people. Oh, so many cases. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, and I find like that process of pulling the thread, I just find personally very fascinating because it's like, it's like, okay, challenge accepted. Like there are many cases that come to mind, one of which, you know, it's very interesting, right? If you're reporting potholes, for instance, the Department of Transportation has a forum and they make it very easy for you. Um, if you happen to be in a public park and you see a pothole on a roadway in a public park, that is under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. So that process is entirely different and, you know, and far less, less organized. Um, if you happen to be going through a tunnel, you're going through an MTA tunnel that is controlled by the MTA, that's you have to, you know, that's their process. If you're going over a bridge that's owned by the Port Authority, that's their process. And so the fragmented way that our network connects, I just find, I mean, this is just like a personal thing for me that I just find it very fascinating. Like, I have, another thing I've failed to do is like, there are places where there's like lane striping, you know, on the highway that is very faded. And there's like a couple of places on like the Gowanus Expressway or whatever, where I'm like, I really would like to see I'd like to see somebody come and paint these lanes. And like what you learn when you start to have that thought and go down that process is um, there are parts of our highway system that are owned by and maintained by New York City. There are parts that are owned by New York State. In some cases, like if you were coming off of the Brooklyn Bridge and you were going to Manhattan and you were going to hop on the FDR Drive northbound, that, um, that curve between the bridge and the FDR Drive, that ramp, is a state road. And so it is under the maintenance jurisdiction of New York State. And once I learned that, I was like, that explains why it is always so like pitted and rocky and like, and the and everything around it is in like decent condition. And so like pulling the thread on that, I was like, okay, so now I've, I've learned that New York State DOT has like a certain point of contact for each of their like maintenance jurisdictions. And I, you know, found the email address of the lady who like runs New York, uh, whatever, runs like that, you know, that department in New York City. I've like become respectfully and gently annoying to that person. So like the, you know, the bureaucratic thicket is like, it is, it is like a, it's such a chaotic, beautiful mess. I don't know. I just find a, it's a very like masochistic bit of joy that I get from it. Regarding the photo request and the documents that you got back, do you, do you ever check the metadata on the document, making sure that it actually happened when it said that it happened and did not come up with that? Oh, I didn't. Um, but so much of it is handwritten and scanned in, and you know, I think you'd really have to be like a master of stagecraft to, you know, to have. Like, I think that is, if they had the time for that and that's where they invested their time, I would almost applaud them. But 
Yeah, but I have actually, I've seen some of these, you know, I've seen some of the like surveyors in their car doing this work. Um, so I believe that it, I believe that it happens. Um, the quality, the people they hire I can't speak to, or the amount of attention, I think, you know, an hour, like I know from my own work, if you're spent, if you're trying to like measure all of those very distinct data points over a one hour period, like again, for me, it required me to record the footage, create an algorithm, go through manually like four times because, you know, I'm just one human. So I can't imagine that a person who's sitting in their car doing it really is, you know, is doing it quite so precisely. I imagine that they are, you know, they have like three they have to get through today and as soon as this one's done, they can go to lunch. And, you know, I happen to be the one who lives on that corner and cares. So, yeah. I think it was done, but the quality, yeah, not so sure. Um, just a quick question, and sorry if you already answered this in the beginning. I wasn't there, but are you a technologist by training? Um... I'm a complete layperson. I, I work as a, a user experience researcher. I'm a qualitative researcher, so I, you know, I have... Uh, I have experience like <laughs> unpacking complicated things and trying to figure out insights from them, but uh, but no, I am yeah, I am otherwise a nobody, just somebody who's you know curious and annoyed at a lot of things that happen outside my window. So if you if any of you fit that uh, that criteria, then I invite you to chat with me afterwards, and we can you know we can brainstorm together. Um, if you could contact one of those uh, traffic control engineers. A burning question to verify any of the work. I don't know. If you could talk to a traffic control engineer, what would you ask them about? Hmm. What I suspect to be true, right, is that as much as I say, like, I am not a trained professional and I am a layperson, there are people out there who know what they're doing, what I believe to be true because I've been around the world often enough is that there are, is still like so much subjectivity so much gray area, everything is sort of qualitative in a way, right? Every little data point that you can find can be twisted to meet the need of whatever argument you would like to make. And I would like to run that hypothesis past the traffic engineer because, you know, the process seems very qualitative and yet very data-backed. And I would like to hear from their perspective how much subjective, subject, subjectivity it seems to involve, how much power and sway they may feel they have over whatever the final recommendation is, or how cut and dry it feels based on the data that they collect. That's the piece that I'd be most interested in personally. I am too, thank you. Awesome. All right, well I think that brings us to time, so thank you very much, and thank you to the Internet Society New York chapter for recording this talk. Thank you all for coming.